Perhaps it all began with Joan Baez and her bare feet. Club 47, a one-room bohemian haunt named for its Harvard Square address, 47 Mount Auburn, hired a 17-year-old Baez on slow nights, which quickly became sold-out nights. She sat on that little stage, raven hair glistening, haunting soprano, singing ancient ballads, barefoot, adding to the primal allure. But she wasn't trying to allure. She went barefoot to calm her stage fright, like she was just singing in her living room. What a beautiful city well Twelve gates into the city Hallelujah Maybe that's when the club became what it's remained for 60 years Folk Music's Living Room Well, dark days come and dark days go It's a world of trouble and pain Ain't it good to know there's a place to go Where you can come in out of the rain game That's right Through three improbable lives as Club 47, Pasim, and now the dynamic Club Pasim, that living room closeness between audience and artist, tradition and change, has kept this little room the most important folk venue in America. Club Pasim now hosts 500 shows a year, including 90 outdoor shows for an annual audience of 30,000. One, two, three. Its music school presents 700 classes a year to over 900 students. Memorial and Labor Day weekend campfire festivals have offered opportunities to over 1,700 budding artists, along with the annual Boston Celtic Music Festival and Down Home Up Here Bluegrass Festival. Promising artists have received $400,000 in grants from the club's Iguana Music Fund. And if we run out of songs to sing, well, we know where to find some more. Casual menu offers sandwiches, salads and desserts, coffee, beer, wine and cocktails, but its beating heart remains that little stage. The audience so close, performers joke about stealing their french fries. I use passim as a metric for measuring larger venues, like I'm four passims away from the stage. Tony-winning songwriter Anais Mitchell says the club is committed to a sense of community and helping new artists find expression. Older than many venues, an institution really, and a compassionate place. We honor the past, but we're not hemmed in by it. After Baez's success, Club 47 quickly became a star-making engine for the 60s revival, launching some of its most important young stars. But that was only part of the magic. It also featured legendary blues and bluegrass elders, forming a powerful mix of young and old, tradition and invention, all in that little room. Vanguard mogul Maynard Solomon told a lanky kid jamming with friends, I'd like to sign your band. That's no band, Jim Queskin replied, but give me a couple months, I'll get one. And that's how the most influential jug band of the 1960s was born. When the weekly Hootenanny ran out of performers, its shy host had to borrow a guitar and sing. And that's how Tom Rush found out audiences liked him. Circle game. When the Charles River Valley Boys made a hit album of Bluegrass Beatles covers, they inspired a revolution called Newgrass. Original owners Joyce Kalina and Paula Kelly were replaced by savvy Byron Leonardos and then Jim Rooney. But Betsy Siggins was a driving force. Judy Collins called her the fierce energy that made this all work. Alternately tender and demanding, Siggins saw her job as whatever needed doing, cajoling the board, booking talent, washing dishes. She had a genius for getting people to pitch in. In Betsy's world, you are a stranger but once. After that, you're a volunteer. It was a place where kids who had very little education could sit in the audience with people who had enormous educations, but music was the common denominator. It still is a common denominator here today. And I think that's what folk music does. It does something very good for the soul because you don't have to want to be a musician to get an awful lot out of it. Crowds waiting outside often broke into song causing the club's eviction in 1963. They were offered a ramshackle basement in an alleyway called Palmer Street. There were no addresses, so the city asked if they wanted zero or one, and they asked to remain 47. 
As the revival grew, performers outgrew Folk's living room. Club 47 closed in 1968. It became McCarthy for President Headquarters before Walter and Renee Judah opened a bookstore galley there called Pasim, hiring beat poets Bob and Rayanne Donlan as managers, soon offering them the lease. Fans begged the Donlans to host folk music, and they were soon featuring the best of a fading folk revival. Once the Donlans saw how much folk needed its living room, preserving this music during its worst commercial years became their cause. In the absence of any external star system, they developed their own, called the Passim Ladder. Headliners performed six shows Friday through Sunday with the same opening act. When audiences got to know the openers, they became the headliners, bringing along the next unknowns. During those lean years, fans got the joke when some local headliners called themselves the Passim All-Stars, but that Passim Ladder became a powerful force in building the stars who drove the next revival and that living room vibe never left. When performers asked Bob about sound checks, he would tap the red light on the board and say, it's on, all set. John Gorka lost his voice, forcing him to learn stagecraft. The voice wasn't there for me, he said, but the audience was. A different kind of communication Dear took over. sons and daughters, we'll do what we must. Who do you love? Who do you trust? The first time Suzanne Vega played there, she was terrified. She asked where to go, and Rayanne said, you're not going anywhere until you eat something. That mothering moment changed everything for Vega. But the revival Passim ignited spawned too many competing venues. By 1995, it was broke, and the Donlins retired. They kept the light on for all of us, said Chris Smither. They just kept it burning. In Passim's darkest moment, Betsy Siggins reappeared, forging the legacies of both venues into a powerful nonprofit called Club Passim, greatly helped by a young fellow who wandered in one night and somehow never left, Matt Smith, who Aeneas Mitchell calls the most evolved, kind-hearted, funny promoter I've ever known. The club's expanded mission creates multiple revenue streams from tickets, donors, memberships, tuition, food, the nonprofit model has been great for us. We don't live or die on the artists we attract, uh, so we can take more chances. Mitchell says Club Passim's genuine nourishment of artists at all stages in their development is what they do best, and it makes a world of difference in the lives it touches. Thank you to the stars above. Thank you to the fans of Hawaii. And thank you to this music. It pulls us through. My biggest thrill is giving them something they didn't know they wanted. I'm amazed at everything I've gotten to experience at Club Pass scene, and I know there's something just around the bend. I know there is. As we keep singing, I don't think we ever have to get old. Oh, that's right. We're not